It's so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Welcome to Legacy House. Uh, my name is Bethany. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, I would love to meet you today on behalf of our team and our pastors. We're so glad you're here. And if it's your first Sunday, we are extra glad that you're here. So thank you for joining us this morning. We're going to take a quick minute to pray before we continue to worship. So would you just join me this morning as we just welcome the Holy Spirit here today? God, you are so welcome this morning. We love you. And God, whatever we've walked in with, God, maybe we've walked in with fear or pain or anxiety or stress. God, we just empty ourselves of all those things because this morning, it, today, it's about you. And God, we just exalt you and we exalt your name, Father. And we just ask that you would come and meet us here today. God, would you speak to us? Let our ears be open to the word that you wanna speak. God, let our hearts be ready to worship you. God, we know your son, Jesus, is coming back soon and we wanna be ready. And so right now, God, we just empty ourselves of the things that would hold us back, God, from giving you our full and total worship and our full and total surrender. And so this morning, God, we worship you and we ask you, God, to do what only you can do. Thank you for your spirit that's present with us this morning. We worship you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship. Oh, I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. And man's empty praise, treasures that fade. I never enough. Come on, we say that you came along. Thank you, Lord. And you put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied. Thank you. 
moment, let's just thank Him for that this morning, this joy we have. That's why there's joy in the house. For what He does, we sing, you turn in morning. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn in shame into glory.
this our prayer, if we can just lift our hands to declare this dependency on him this morning. We're not gonna leave here the way that we came in today. We're gonna leave here with more of him and less of us. Sing, oh Lord, change me. We sing it together. Oh Lord, change me like only you can. Here with my heart in your hands. Father, I pray, make me more like Jesus. This world is dying to know. Hey church, as we get ready to close worship, I wanted to do something this morning, take a moment uh, for prayer. Every single week, uh, people submit prayer requests into our church. They can go to our website or our app and they can submit different requests. And uh, we, we get them periodically here and there, church our size. And uh, of course, all of us maybe even have needs that we just don't take the time to maybe submit that form into the church. But many of you do and we really appreciate it. Our pastors and our team uh, we do pray for you guys when we see those come in. But over about the last 30 days, um, we've just seen an increase in some specific needs, some specific prayer requests. And, um, and I had them on my phone this morning. Uh, we have people in our church who have recently received uh, cancer diagnosis. Uh, we have people in our church that are praying because there are vision problems that they're having. Doctors are saying that their eyesight uh, because of you know whatever's going on there that people might lose their eyesight. We have people that are struggling with hearing uh, problems, people that have submitted prayer requests in regards to financial stress and difficulties when it comes to uh, just, just bills and their livelihood, people who are praying for marriages to be restored and those relationships that have uh, been strained that are very, very close to them. And so these are people that uh, you could be sitting just a row apart from. And a lot of times on a Sunday, you might not even know that um, because we all got a great Sunday morning face, don't we? And uh, you wouldn't even know that you're worshiping perhaps next to someone that's walking through something really difficult right now. They're walking through a moment when a doctor has said the worst possible word they think they could ever hear or, or something really trying is going on in their house. And sometimes you would never know it, but but thank you so much for letting us know as a staff and as a team, because we wanna pray for you, not just during our week, but I wanna pray right now if we can. And so church, if you're comfortable, if you just wanna kinda of extend your hand just as a sign of agreement, man, let's just pray for these people. I want you to pray. Now here's, here's the part about moments like this in church, right? A prayer moment like this, is you can't just let me be the only one praying. If we're a church family, man, then right where you are, I want you to pray. I want you to go to God like it was you that just got that bad report. Because maybe one day if you do get the bad report, you would want someone praying just as fervently for you as we're gonna pray for them right now, amen? So let's just pray together. So Father, in Jesus' name, let's just all pray right where we're at. Lord, we lift these individuals up to you. We don't necessarily know all their names, but God, we lift them up to you right now. Those who need a miracle in healing, God, those that need a miracle in their finances, those that need a miracle in a restoration of a friendship or a marriage or, or a strained relationship with their, their, uh, their son or their daughter. God, you see all of these needs and I thank you for every individual that just had the courage and the boldness to simply just submit a form online so that we could be in prayer for them. Holy Spirit, right now, we ask that you would visit them, that you would do what only you can do, God. We pray healing and wholeness over people's physical bodies. I pray literally as people go and see doctors again this week or next week or later this month, God, that the next report will be a better report. The next report is gonna be a report that shows signs of healing, that shows signs of mending, God. I pray for that marriage that's struggling right now. And I pray that as each individual yield to you, God, and they welcome the ministry of the Holy Spirit into that home and into that marriage, that you would soften hearts, that you would bring 
forgiveness to, to one another, God, and you would heal and you would restore those types of relationships. So Lord, every need, whatever it is, God, bring sight back to people that are losing it. Restore hearing back to those that it's diminishing in them, God. We just lift all of these needs up to you. We believe in a God that does miracles. We believe in a God that does signs and wonders. That's the God that we read about in the Bible, and you're the same yesterday, today, and forever in Jesus' name, God. So we pray for these people, and we just stand with them in agreement, in faith, knowing that you can do exceedingly more than we even ask or imagine in every circumstance. We love you, and we pray for these in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, as we close worship, why don't we just put our hands together? Why don't we thank God? Come on, He's a good God. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our worship. And today's going to be an awesome day. Yeah, come on, it's beautiful outside, man. What an awesome weekend we've had. And uh, you might enjoy it later this afternoon, but this morning, come on, being in God's house is the best place you can be. You made a wise decision on this Sunday morning. So hey, as our house kids are being dismissed and they're gonna catch up with their teachers that way, as they're headed out, turn around, greet somebody, tell them, welcome into church this morning. to see you myself and our superstar worship leader mr ian have a couple quick announcements for you the first one is that our next summer group semester starts on may 19th and we're super excited about that uh, you know if you aren't familiar with what we do with groups we just want to make a bigger church feel smaller right and we want to give an opportunity during the week for people to just get to know each other yeah. uh, around them. And, and so it's a really exciting opportunity. And, and really the goal there is, you know, we want, you know, to cover as many different walks of life in a lot of different areas, right? St. John's County, Duval County. We wanna have a group around and nearby everybody in the church. And so, you know, with that being said, we need leaders. We need leaders, right, Ian? Yeah, we do. So. You know, if you are interested, if you've been praying to be a, a group leader, you know, it could be as simple as, you know, coffee hangout and talking yeah. about the service, or it could be an acti activity that you already do every week. And so uh, anything that you kind of have on your heart, you know, we would love to meet you after service. You can see the very uh, handsome face of Mr. Mark Zoon outside at the white tent in the lobby yeah. if you're interested in leading a group. And then the second announcement, and then uh, I'll let Ian go, is uh, we have our monthly outreach for Cup of Love coming up yeah. on April 27th. And, you know, that's just an opportunity for us to be the hands and feet of Jesus. You know, we get to serve the homeless community here in Jacksonville. And so if you're interested in that, you can go to our Legacy House app and join the missions group. Awesome. What Thanks, else we got? Frank. Thanks, Frank. So our next couple announcements, the first one up, or the third one, is going to be VBS, Vacation Bible School. So this is for our elementary students and younger. We're excited in the yeah. house for it. I hear you. Yeah. Um, but it's an opportunity. This is a one-week event. We get to partner with Redeemer Church out in Ponte Vedra, and it's really just an incredible, intensive, immersive week for your students to get to dive into the truths of God's Word and yeah. understand who He is and dive deeper into that. And so. Yeah. If you're a parent, if you're interested at all, go ahead and jump on our Legacy House app and have um, your kids signed up for that. Yeah. You won't regret it. For one week and one week only. Just a week. Parents, Half a let, day. Us, let us help you get a little summer break. You know what <laughs> I mean? So we got you. Of course, and then our second one-week event, also geared towards our next generation. Legacy Youth, where are you at? If you're a student in the room, wave at me. Woo! Love it. Well, we have our youth summer camp that we are so excited about. Joey Zoon and his team have put together an incredible experience, and um, I'm excited. I will be there. A lot of our students are going. And with that said, a lot of spots are filling up. We're running out of space. So if yeah. you have the inkling or the instinct or um, something in you, it's like, I might want to check that out. 
please jump on our Legacy House app. Talk to Joey Zoon. Yeah. Um, he would love to get you guys signed up for that. It's going to be an incredible time, incredible yeah. experience. And then I, I think I heard that there's uh, roller coasters involved. Is that right? Perhaps. Perhaps. Roller coasters, hanging out with Ian and Joey. That sounds like an awesome summer. It's going to be a great week. Yeah. We're excited for it. And then lastly, just like Pastor Clay talked about earlier, we are a house of prayer. The house of God should be a house of prayer before it's anything else. And yep. so we have a team that wants to pray with you, whether you have a need, um, a praise report, um, if you need somebody, a shoulder to cry on, or just somebody to rejoice in the Lord with what he's doing in your life, we wanna partner with you in that. And so we have a team after service every Sunday that's designed specifically for that. And yep. so if you have a prayer need or have a praise report, come down to the front afterward. We would love to pray with you. Awesome. Hey, and if you wanna keep up to date with all of our events, you can always just download the app, use this QR code, look for the Legacy House app, and you can just uh, just continue to keep update with yeah. all the things that we have. I mean, we got a ton of things going on. We have a really fun summer oh, coming yeah. up, and our church is always just uh, ready to kind of have different things outside of Sundays for you. So 100%. yeah, let's go ahead and get our notes and Bibles ready, and Pastor Clay is gonna give us an awesome message. Amen, Thanks, let's get guys. to it. Hey, good morning again, Legacy House. Will you put your hands together? Let's welcome everyone that's with us online. Right now, all of our online church family, good to have you. Now you might be traveling uh, maybe this weekend, uh, but we are so glad that you made church a priority and that you jumped on the Legacy House YouTube channel uh, to catch the service and the message this morning. Hopefully we'll see you next Sunday, man, back in town, back in the building. So thankful for technology, right? What an amazing generation we live in that we can use things like that as a tool to continue to reach people even as uh, work and different things take them uh, on the road. But even with all of that, there's nothing better than being in the house, right? There's nothing better than being in the room. The room is the best place to be, and uh, I will die on that hill. And so, uh, hey, if you got your Bible, open up to the book of Luke. It's going to be in your New Testament, the book of Luke, the third book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, right there in the New Testament of your Bible. I uh, want to remind us today as well uh, that just as we've worshiped in song, which by the way, man, can we just put our hands together for the team, man? Just... Uh, they're all off to the side, and so Victor's the only one left, so we'll just clap for Victor right now since he's on stage. But, um, but no, I mean, Pastor Peter, obviously bringing leadership to the, to the team and all of our amazing worship leaders, they do uh, a phenomenal job. And, uh, and Jordan, who was kind of leading right here in the center today, so glad Jordan's in town. He's a, a church friend from the Savannah, Georgia area, known Jordan for a long time, and uh, always great when he's in town. Love him so much, he and his family. And, uh, but just as we've worshiped, in song, and we're getting ready to worship in receiving the word. I wanna remind us today that we have the chance to worship in our giving. Um, and, and hear my heart, because I thought I would just take a second today. We don't do this maybe every Sunday, but I wanted to take a second to talk about our giving, because my heart as a, as a pastor in your life is that I would do my best to convey that when we tithe and when we give offering and when we're generous, my heart is that we would always see that as an act of worship. I don't know if you grew up being taught that that's what that is, um, but it is truly just as much an act of worship as the moments of singing songs and the moments of hearing and receiving the word or a moment of taking communion together in a certain, like that's how scripture wants us to see giving. It is an act of worship. And, and so because it's an act of worship, the Bible says whenever you do it, do it with intentionality. The Bible says each individual should already determine in their heart what they want to sow and what they want to give. So what that means is the Bible says we, we shouldn't really come into church and be like, oh man, giving time. Oh, what, do, what do I got today? Like if, if that's how we approach giving, we've been doing it the wrong way. 
Like, like that's like giving, God is not like a celestial waiter or waitress that we just kind of tip on the way out on a Sunday morning. No, the Bible says, let's be determined people. Let's be intentional in our giving, right? And so I'm not here to preach a whole giving message today, but I just wanted to encourage you with that this morning, man. It is an act of worship. So just as you get excited to sing the songs and excited to hear the message, let's be equally as excited, man, to give and to sow into all that God's doing in the life of our church. And if you've been with us for some time, man, you've seen the growth and you've seen what our giving together collectively has been able to accomplish. And, uh, and we got a lot of vision for the future at the same time. I pray that we are always a church with more vision than we even have resource. I don't, want, I don't want to have more resource and, and we're low on vision. I want to make sure we got big vision and we know what God's called us to and we want to keep serving people well, loving people well, caring for this community as best we can, have a big vision, and then the resource is going to follow that. So let me pray for us. As a matter of fact, right now, as we do prepare to give today, maybe right now or even as we leave today, if you have a physical gift, let me just pray for that giving right now. So Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this act of worship. We give intentionally to you today, God. We have decided in our hearts how each of us, our households are gonna participate. We're not sowing to any individual. We're not, we're not sowing to man. We are sowing to the Lord. And God, I pray that you would bless every gift and giver, that you would uh, build the houses of every family that have chosen with their own finances to help build your house. And so, God, we trust you with these gifts this morning. We put them straight into your hand, knowing that they'll accomplish a good kingdom work. And, uh, and we worship you in our giving today. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Thanks for your generosity, church. It's week two today of a series that we started last Sunday called Shame Breaker, as you can see behind me. Uh, I purposefully wanted to tackle this series after Easter because, you know, you get on Easter Sunday, we talk about sin, we talk about Jesus going to the cross and then raising again out of the tomb, right, into new life and how we can participate in that new life when we believe in him, we receive him as Lord and Savior of our life. But, but even more than just defeating sin, which I don't want to belittle that, that was a big deal, but even more than just crushing sin, Jesus also wants to defeat shame in our life. Because most of us, even if we've been following Jesus for many, many decades, there's a good chance that some of us, even though your sin was handled and you believe in Jesus and you're a Christ follower, some of us still carry shame from things that have happened in our past, stuff that we have done, or maybe even things that have happened to us. And so last week we kicked this series off and we talked about a few different things. We talked about the difference between guilt and shame. That, that, that we, we try to use those words interchangeably, but they're actually different. We talked last week about the fact that grace cancels guilt. That's what happened on the cross. And we also talked last week that grace redefines us from failure to family. Of course, if you missed that first message on shame, you can find it on the YouTube channel, but we're jumping into week two right now. And so I said this last week, but I wanna say it again. Why does the devil use shame against us. It's going to come up on the screen. This is why. Because if the devil can't keep you out of heaven, then shame is the tool he knows will give you hell on earth. That's why the devil uses shame. Maybe your sin's handled, right? You're a Christ follower. I'm not saying you're not a believer. You're a Christ follower. And, and so he couldn't keep you out of heaven. But if he can't do that, then he knows what I'll do is I'll just heap shame on them from things that they've done, stuff that has happened to them, so that at least the rest of their time on this earth is gonna be a living hell. Raise your hand if you've ever had a moment, maybe you're in a moment right now, where you've ever experienced shame. Like, I would imagine every hand, even people online, if you're in your kitchen eating Belgian waffles right now, raise your hand, right? Like, like we've all dealt with shame, right? Shame is brutal and it attacks and the enemy uses it as a tool to give us hell on earth. So let's jump into week two, man. I'm believing today is gonna to really encourage some people. Hopefully you even walk out free from the weight of shame today that's just been probably pretty heavy on you. Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 31. This is before Jesus goes to the cross. So he hasn't gone to the cross yet. He says, Simon, Simon, of course, we know that's Peter as well. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you all 
as wheat. But I've prayed for you, Simon, watch this, that your faith may not fail. That your faith may not fail. I wrote it in my notes like this, church, sometimes we fail. (laughs) Some of us more often than others, perhaps. Sometimes we fail, but watch this. It's important that we don't let our faith fail even in moments of failure. It's important that even when you miss the mark, right, that's sin. You, you came short of the standard of God, that's, that's sin. You made an error, you, you were disobedient. Even when you fail in a moment, Jesus is saying, Simon Peter, I'm praying for you that even in moments of failure, your faith will not fail. Even in moments when I miss the mark and I don't do it like I needed to do it and, 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 I, and I perhaps fail in a moment of, 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 of just not paying attention or, or, or whatever it is and, and I miss the mark, even in that moment, man, I pray that my faith in Jesus doesn't fail. I pray that I still have everything that I need to say, you know what, I made a mistake, I did something wrong that was really dumb of me, but I'm still gonna go back in faith to Jesus knowing that he can bring forgiveness and grace into my life. And look what Jesus says, not only that your faith may not fail, but he's saying this to Peter, and when, everyone say when. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. See, that's so good right there. It's almost like Jesus was saying, I I know you're gonna mess up sometimes, I know you're gonna fail, but when? When you turn back. Notice what Jesus did not say. Jesus didn't say, hey man, but if, And if you turn back, no, there's no if. Jesus says in Simon, when? When, I love it because church, no one believes in you more than Jesus. No one is for you more than Jesus. No one wants you to succeed more than Jesus Christ. Man, he is, he's believing the best for you. He's believing the best for your future. He's believing the best for the days ahead. He, He wasn't looking at Simon and saying, yeah, man, you know, if you come back, he's saying, no, Simon, I believe when you come back, when? Jesus is showing, man, I'm for you. I'm believing the best in you. Verse 33, but, but Simon replies, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Like, these are bold words. He's like, man, I'm your guy, Jesus. And Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Peter's probably thinking, there's no chance. It's not gonna happen. No, man, I am your guy, man. I can't, I don't know about these other 11, but Jesus, I'm your man. I'll go to prison. I'll die right by your side. And Jesus like, yeah, I hear what you're saying. We're gonna see about that here in a few minutes, right? And, 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 and so then we skip down, look at verse 54. Same chapter, verse 54. And then seizing him, Jesus, so the Roman soldiers have now shown up and they're taking Jesus. They led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. And watch what the next sentence says. Peter followed at a distance. I wrote it in my notes like this. We often wander into disaster when we only follow Jesus at a distance. We often, that that was good, that deserved maybe five amens, I don't know, right? I'm not counting, but. We often wander into disaster when we only follow Jesus at a distance. You're saying a lot of bold stuff at the beginning of that chapter. I mean, man death, whatever it is, let's do this, right? Like he's, he's really bull. And then all of a sudden Jesus gets some handcuffs put on him. And what does Peter do? He kind of, oh, he's kind of backing off a little bit. Maybe he's not as bold. He's not as courageous. And he starts following only at a distance, right? Fear is kicking in. Self-preservation is kicking in for Peter. And then in verse 55, let's keep reading. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, sat down together, Peter sat down with them. And a servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and she said, this man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I, I, I don't know him. He said a little later, someone else responded and said, You're, you are also one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him for he is a Galilean. And Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking the rooster crowed. In verse 61, look at this. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Can you imagine that moment? Can you imagine the intenseness of that moment? Jesus looks straight at him from perhaps across the street because he knows 
you just denied me like I said you would. But then it closes like this. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And Peter went outside and wept bitterly. Week two, shame breaker. I wanna speak just for a few minutes, for 26 minutes and five seconds. Clock back there. On what I've entitled, the accuser and the advocate. The accuser and the advocate. So Lord, just one more time, speak to us today from your word. God, I pray that it would be um, revelation, yes, inspiration perhaps, um, but God, give us the determination to lean into you, allowing what only you can do, God, to break shame off of our life and bring us into freedom, I pray in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen, amen. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever had a moment in life where you saw something or you heard something and it reminded you of of some event in your past, right? A little bit of nostalgia or or, or whatever, uh, deja vu perhaps, right? I wrote some things down. Maybe you hear a particular song and it makes you think back to like the days in high school. Uh, that happened to Bethany and I. As a matter of fact, last week we had DNA and we were driving home late after DNA, uh, hanging out with all the home team members and we were just playing like high school stuff that when we were just belting it out in our car uh, together, just like the stuff that, that, that was like what we listened to when we were in high school. You know, they always say, I don't know if this is true, they say in regards to music that your favorite type of music will always be whatever you were listening to between the age of about 16 and 21. Like that'll always be kind of the stuff that resonates with you. And so we're belting it out in the car, right? It was a, it was a very nostalgic type of, of moment. Or maybe you smell a certain type of food and it reminds you of grandma's house, right? You're like, oh my gosh, that reminds me of my grandmother's, what, you know, whatever dish or that dish. And someone said one time, they're like, man, how, why is it that like grandmas are always just the best cooks, right? Grandma just does it better than anybody. And it's easy because she's had 60 years to get it right. Okay. So, I mean, she, it's, it, she's had a time or two, right? To twerk the to twerk to, is that right? I don't know if that's the right word to tweak. That's what I wanted to say. Take that out right now. We're going to cancel that out of the, uh, off the live stream to tweak the recipe. But maybe that's what reminded you. You smell something that reminds you of grandma's house. Maybe you go to the beach. It reminds you of a, a past vacation that you had with some friends, this or that. Maybe you, certain things remind you of Christmas. When the Christmas season comes around, I had a thought the other day. There's, there's one thing that always reminds me of an event in my past, and it's that movie. Of course, it's been done 10 million different ways now. That movie, A Christmas Carol. That, that movie, like Scrooge, right? And, 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 the, and the memory I have is when I was in elementary school, my parents are down here, they'll remember this. Our church that we grew up in in South Carolina, we would always do a yearly production uh, of like Scrooge, A Christmas Carol. This was back when churches would do like, you know, plays and stuff during like Easter and Christmas and all that. They don't do it as much anymore. But, but I remember I'm, I, was, I was young, elementary school, and I'm in the play and we were at a dress rehearsal one night. And so everyone's in full costume and here I am, I'm just a young kid. I got my full costume on. I was wearing like khaki pants, right? Because it's the nineties and every kid just wore khaki pants. And, and, and so here I am, I'm in my khakis and, and I'm about to have to go out on stage and, 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 you know, do my lines and announce my lines, but I needed to use the restroom first. And so I go side of stage to, to use the restroom and, and I'll be as delicate as I can, but I must've just been standing a little too close to the urinal at that particular time. And, and, and so if I'm being honest, there was a little bit of backsplash, I guess that got on my, on my khakis, right? My nice khakis that I had on, right? And, 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 and so, but now I gotta, I gotta get out of there. I gotta get out of the restroom. I gotta come back out here and do my lines. And, and I'm, how embarrassing that was for me at a young age to just walk out there and everyone's like, what's wrong with this kid? I mean, good grief, right? And maybe, I don't know, could people like smell the, the scent? I don't know. Like someone's like, what, what is that a new scent? What is that, Urinate by Calvin Klein? I don't know, right? It was awful, and so every time I see the movie A Christmas Carol, I'm reminded of that embarrassing moment for me. True story, right? That's why I don't wear khakis anymore. But anyways, um, maybe you hear something, you see something, it reminds you of something in your past. I think we all have moments like that. And watch this, this is where I'm going with all of this because sometimes those events that we're reminded of were fun, they were enjoyable, 
Uh, They were exciting. But sometimes we hear things and we see things and it reminds us of a past event that wasn't fun. Maybe it reminds us of something in our past that was painful or hurtful or sad or, or, or really disheartening or depressing. And it's in those moments that it's extremely easy for shame to resurface. So, something happened, you're, you're, you're years past a certain event, but all of a sudden you see something or you hear something and it triggers that memory and, and you haven't even thought about that thing for so long, but then in a moment, shame resurfaces in your life. And you're like, good grief, where did this come from? But because of something perhaps in your past. The Bible told us that story right there in in Luke chapter 22. It says that Peter, he's saying a lot of bold stuff. Of course, Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. And Peter's like, man, I'm your guy. I'll I'll go to prison with you. I'll die with you. All this kind of stuff. And Jesus is like, man, listen to me. I'll tell you the truth. Before the day is even over, the rooster's going to crow. You're going to deny me three times. All this kind of stuff. And and, and sure enough, it happens just like Jesus said. And, And Peter, he did it once. He did it twice. He did it a third time, the denying. And as soon as the third time ends, Ended, he hears the crow of the rooster. The Bible says he's weeping. He's broken. Watch this. Not just because of the guilt, but it's because of the shame that he feels. And this is how I want to preach it this morning. I think for those of us who grew up in church and we've heard that story, a lot of us assume this. A lot of us assume that it was just that one rooster It was just that one moment, rooster crows, Peter feels bad, but then he kind of gets on with the rest of his life. But I want to preach it a little bit different this morning, because I think the real way to view what's going on right here, in order for you to understand this passage of scripture, you got to understand third world countries. In fact, we have a team right now uh, that we have sent to Nicaragua. They're in Nicaragua right now, a third world country. Maybe they're watching online. Shout out to our missions team in Nicaragua this weekend. But, but if you've gone to third world countries, I've, I've gone to many of them. In fact, my very first missions trip was to the country of Nicaragua. And especially whenever you get on the outskirts of maybe the major key city. You'll find that in these smaller towns and smaller villages, if you can even call them that, they're just so small at times, but, but there are chickens and roosters that just roam everywhere. They're everywhere. You're like, does someone want to like put these in a cage? No, they don't, they don't care. They're just everywhere. And I'll never forget the first time I went on a mission trip, I thought that a rooster was simply like nature's alarm clock in the morning. Right? They just, the sun comes up, the rooster crows, and that's how, you know, they used to do it in the old days. And you just know it's time to get up and get to work, right? What I didn't know is that, no, 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 roosters crow all day long for no apparent reason. They just crow all the time. I mean, just, just in middle of the day, in the middle of the afternoon, it doesn't, they're just always crowing. And so watch this. I don't think it was just this one rooster that brought shame and guilt to Peter. No, Peter's living in a culture where he's probably hearing rooster crows all the time. And every time, perhaps, he hears the rooster crow. Shame. It wasn't just one, and then now we're on with the rest of our life. No, I would imagine for the next several days and weeks, every time he would hear a rooster, he would remember what Jesus said, He would remember what he did and shame would come on his life. Could you imagine just going days and days, perhaps weeks and weeks with just shame and guilt, some, something in him just constantly feeling unworthy, something in him it was reminding him of, of the horrible mistake, the stain in his past, the fact that he failed Jesus. He's thinking to himself, how could I have been so stupid? What was I thinking? How could I have done that? Oh my gosh, Peter, why? You know, I mean, he's getting down on himself, right? How, have you ever been there, church? I don't know if you have. I have. You ever been in a moment like that, unable to move past something that you have done, something that you've said, something that you've acted on? Or maybe let's, let's flip it the other way, unable to move past something that was done to you? Maybe it wasn't even your fault. In a church our size with people who watch us online week to week, let me just, it, 
It doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that there's people among us who have walked through moments of abuse in your past, all types of abuse, and you did nothing to deserve it, but for whatever reason, the crow of shame has come after you for years and years and years, and the rooster just will not relent. I've lived long enough to know this. The enemy will try to take something that you did or something that happened to you and convince you that's who you are. Nothing could be further from the truth. That is not who you are. See, there's a difference between guilt and shame. Let me just, just cross it off the list one more time today. Guilt comes from something that you did. Shame comes from something that you believe you are. So guilt is action-based. Shame is identity based. And Peter is here weeping bitterly, not just because of the guilt of failing, but rather the shame of believing I am a failure. And I've learned, I, I turned 39 years old this summer, but I've learned that the devil, the enemy, his real strong point is actually not temptation, it's accusation. If you thought he was a good tempter, boy, he's a 10 times better accuser. He, he, he loves to accuse. He is that rooster that is just constantly in our ear, just going off, reminding us of the moments in our past that bring shame. In fact, the Bible calls him the accuser of the brothers and sisters. Look at Revelation chapter 12. It says, then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser, that's the enemy of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night. This is a full-time job accuser. Has been hurled down and they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Boy, I believe today God wants to teach us how to triumph over the accuser. The enemy wants to convince you that you are something, perhaps after he got you to do something. He wants you grieving. He wants you depressed. He wants you hearing the crow of guilt and the crow of shame. He wants you stuck. He wants you not moving forward. He is the accuser of everyone. Christ follower or not, he just wants to heap shame on human beings. Wrote it in my notes, have you ever noticed that the moments you need to pray the most are often the moments when you feel worthy to pray the least? I'll say that again just so someone can catch that. Have you ever noticed the moments you need to pray the most are the same moments you feel worthy to pray the least? What's going on there? Shame. Shame. You know you need to pray. You know you need to bring it to the Lord. You know you're knowledgeable enough to know that therein lies your salvation to this problem and this issue, but just something in you just can't allow you to approach him. Something in you is stopping you from moving toward him. What is it? It's shame. It's shame that's keeping you from moving toward the very person that holds your healing and holds your freedom. The enemy loves to accuse us, but I love what scriptures write in John chapter 14. Ready? Here's the hope. Ready for some hope this morning? Here it is, John 14 and 26. But the advocate. Remember, there's an accuser, but there's an advocate. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have said to you. You see, the enemy tries to tell you who you are, but Jesus wants to remind you of who you really are. He comes into our life as an advocate. He reminds us of the word of God. He reminds us of what scripture says a Christ follower is. He reminds you that you are an heir of righteousness. He reminds you that you are a son and you are a daughter in Christ and you are welcomed into the family of God through repentance and faith, right? He reminds you of those things. There is an accuser, but there is also an advocate. And while the accuser is shaming, the advocate is defending. And while the accuser shouts disgrace, the advocate extends grace. 
Look at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. My dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not be in sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. So there's an accuser and there's an advocate. And what scripture wants you to see is this, is that the accuser, and we already read that verse, the accuser will go to the father. He'll stand before God and the accuser will point at you and the accuser will look at the father and say, sin, their sin, their sin, their sin, their sin. But the advocate in the same place to the right of God, the father says, no, no, my blood, my blood, my blood, grace, 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 forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. Come on. Anybody thankful for an advocate this morning that's up in heaven defending you before the Father? And because you repented and because you placed faith in Jesus, he's not just gonna let you fight your own battle. You don't even have to represent yourself in court. Jesus says, I will defend you before the great throne, and he defends. And he says, my blood covered that. And there doesn't have to be any more guilt, and there doesn't have to be any more shame. Praise God for an advocate. You always have a choice as to who you want to listen to. You want to listen to the accuser or you want to listen to the advocate. Let me give you a little bit about shame while we're here. The three P's of shame. Dr. Henry Cloud, who is a pretty well-known psychologist and author, he talked about this at one point in one of his books. He talked about the three P's of shame. I thought it was pretty profound and true. This is what shame desires to do in your life. Number one, shame desires to be personal. Personal. So, so shame doesn't say you made a bad decision. No, no, no. Shame says you are a horrible person. It's personal. That's how, that's how shame wants to be. Number two, shame desires to be permanent. So, so shame will do something like this. It'll come and it'll say, man, you always do this. You always mess up. You're just like your mom. Oh, you're just like your dad. You always are making this mistake. And the truth is, no, you don't always do this, but shame doesn't want it to just be one little thing. Shame wants it to be permanent. You, you always, and it tries to convince you that you're an always type of sinner or mistake maker or whatever. Shame desires to be permanent. But the third one is this, shame wants to be pervasive. In other words, it wants to spread to every area of your life. So shame comes and shame says this, man, you screw up everything, everything. And so many of us, we listen to the lie and we're like, oh, you're right, I do screw up everything. And the truth is, no, you don't. You don't screw up everything. There's a lot of stuff you do really good and really well. But, but yeah, you had a mistake over here, but shame wants you to believe. No, no, it's not just right there. It's everything. It wants to be pervasive across your life. So the question for you and I today is this. Here's some homework. What rooster is still crowing at you? What rooster is still crowing at you? What sin, what mistake, what failure is still haunting you every other day. Some of us are like, man, it happened decades ago, pastor. I know, and it's still coming after you and crowing in your ear every other day. What painful moment of the past, maybe that was completely outside of your control, is still coming back to your mind every other day. And the rooster just keeps crowing and crowing and crowing because listen to me, church, shame is not the solution. Shame cannot fix what only grace was meant to cure. Shame isn't going to get it done. Wouldn't it be nice to go back to this moment in scripture in the book of Luke to be there and knowing what we know now and all of this and to be able to look at Peter and say, Peter, listen to me, the, the, the rooster's going to crow and Peter, it's true. You're going to have denied Jesus three times, man, and, and it's going to happen, right? It's going to happen, Peter, and the rooster's going to crow. But listen to me, Peter, when the rooster crows, this is what I need you to know, Peter, even though you did it, that's not who you are. That's not who you are, Peter. Don't let shame chase you, Peter. Moment of mistake, sure. 
but that's not who you are. Peter's struggling with shame. And isn't shame loud? Shame's not quiet. Shame doesn't whisper. Shame's loud. It gets our attention in life. But what's louder than shame? The voice of the advocate. Peter's struggling. The rooster keeps reminding him of his failure. But then one day everything changes for Peter. As I invite the band to come and join us right now, Peter has a moment where everything changes and we see it in Acts chapter two. In Acts chapter two, the Bible says that Peter and some others, they got together and they're praying and it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they're all together in one place and suddenly there was a what? There's a sound. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They all seemed to have tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Church, I point this out to all of us today to simply make this point in this statement. There is a sound that is greater than the sound of your past. There's a sound that is greater than the sound of your past. Come on, it's a sound full of grace. It's a sound full of truth and love and forgiveness and purpose. It's the sound and the voice of the advocate. They heard a sound that day and they're praying, but they hear this sound. What was the sound? It was the sound of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And we read clearly in scripture just a few moments ago that the Holy Spirit was the advocate, right? Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God, he's the advocate in our life. There's a sound that's greater than the sound of our past. It's the sound of the advocate. It's the voice of Jesus. It's the voice of who he says we are. It's the voice of what the Bible declares us to be. Listen, there is something about Jesus, boy. He has the power to break shame off of our life. He breaks the power of the past. He breaks every voice that the enemy is, is speaking in our ear. And that day, man, Peter, he hears a new voice. It was, it was previously the voice of a rooster that brought shame and, and condemnation and guilt to him. But thank God he steps into this moment of prayer and now a new voice and a new sound comes to Peter and it fills him with boldness and it fills him with courage. And he actually understands who he is now in Christ. And he walks out of the room, down the steps, out into the street, preaches his first message and 3000 people give their lives to Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing how fruitful Peter's life became as soon as he started listening to the right sound? Isn't it fascinating how quickly he just got down to doing great kingdom work as soon as he started listening to the right voice? You get to choose which voice you wanna to listen to I'm not saying it's easy. I understand shame puts up a fight. But some of us, you've just, you've been listening to the accuser for years and years, maybe decades. You get to choose today though. I, I'm gonna walk out of here. I'm gonna silence the voice of the accuser. I'm gonna start listening to the voice of the advocate. I wrote into my notes like this. There is a voice that is greater than every other voice because there is a name that is greater than every other name. The name of Jesus. The enemy wants you living in constant shame. He wants to remind you of your past. And here's the cycle for some of us. Let me show you how the cycle works. We, we come into church, right? Sunday morning like this. You're like, man, it's all right. Great music, worship, good message. Uh, I feel, I'm feeling good. All right, feeling good about this week. Feel, feel better about myself. Oh, man, I really needed Sunday, man. All right. And, and then you get to Monday and then and Monday was okay. And then it's like for some of us, by the time you get to Tuesday, it's like 48 hours removed from Sunday morning in God's house, you get to Tuesday. And then all of a sudden, what are you hearing again? There's the rooster. And he just shows right back up in your life and he's crowing and he's crowing and you can't get him to stop and you're just like, oh, I just don't wanna think about that moment anymore. It's so many years, I don't wanna think about that thing that happened to me. I don't, I don't wanna think about that thing that I did. I'm so tired, I feel bad enough and it's just crow, 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 crow. Here's what I want you to do this week. Let's break the cycle, right? 
just stop, stop being on the hamster wheel anymore. Let's just get off the wheel. Let's break the cycle. This is what I want you to do. The next time the rooster comes crowing in your ear about your past, I want you to speak back to the rooster. If someone's like just watching that moment of the message, like this church is weird. What is he even talking about? Out of context, that sounds crazy. I want you to talk back to the rooster. And this is what I want you to say to that voice of shame. Simple. What you say I did is not who I am. That's all you gotta say. What you say I did is not who I am. What happened to me that awful day is not who I am. An accuser, you have no authority over me. You have no authority. You don't get to tell me who I am because you didn't make me and you didn't create me. Creator gets to define my life. The author of my life can define my life. Accuser, you are not that. What you say I did is not who I am. And then you just go ahead and you just tell them who you are. I'm a son of the most high God. I have been forgiven and redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I once was alienated. I once was an enemy of God, but in Jesus Christ, I have been welcomed into his beautiful family. I am an heir of righteousness. I rule and reign with Jesus Christ. An accuser, by the way, the word of God, which holds power and authority, tells me that you are not in my ear, you are underneath my feet. Go ahead and talk back to him this week. Shut him up. Because Shane's been talking to you long enough. There's an accuser, but there's an advocate. You don't have to walk around full of shame. I wrote it like this and we're done. The only way to heal from shame is to move the focus from what I'm not to who Jesus is. So you say to yourself, man, I'm not enough. I'm not enough, I'm not enough, I'm not enough. But listen, Jesus is more than enough. Get the focus off what you're not, get it on who Jesus is. He's enough. Say to yourself, I'm, I'm not good. Oh, I'm not, I'm not good, I am so bad, I've done so, I am, I am not good. But listen, but Jesus is perfection and he offers us that perfection and righteousness through grace to be like him. Say, well, I'm, I'm not deserving of another chance. No way, man, I've, I've used up all my mulligans. I've used up all my second chance. I, I, I am not deserving of another chance, but watch, Jesus offers grace through repentance. There is another chance. In fact, that's what grace is. Grace is not deserved. By definition, it is the undeserved, unmerited favor of God. You can't deserve grace. And the second you think you deserve grace, it ceases to be grace. Because grace, by definition, is undeserved. You say to yourself, I'm not strong enough. I'm not strong enough to move forward. But Jesus' power is made perfect in your weakness. Get the focus off what I'm not. Get it on who Jesus is. We all have an accuser, but the question is, do you have an advocate? And finally, look at Psalm 34 and verse 5 when it says this. It says, those who look to him for help, talking of Jesus, will be radiant with joy. We read this last week. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. When you come to the advocate and you look to Jesus, one of the promises he makes is you do not have to any longer live in the shadow of shame. And so as we close this morning, simple last question, we all have an advocate, but do we all have, or we all have the accuser, excuse me, but do we all have an advocate? Have you surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Have you given yourself fully to him. Lord, I believe in you. I, I, I repent from my sin and my ways. I receive your grace. I place my faith in you. I need an advocate and I recognize Jesus that it's you. And if you haven't done that yet this morning, I would love to pray with you. I'm not going to embarrass you. 
but I don't want you to walk out of here today with only an accuser. I want you to walk out of here with an advocate. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, this morning, if you know today is the day, man, you need to give your life to Jesus Christ, or maybe you're just unsure about how your relationship is with God and you just, you don't even know where you and he stand right now. I'd rather you walk out of here with assurance. You're saying, man, yes, pastor, pray for me. I, I, wanna, I wanna give my life to Christ. I wanna be called a son and a daughter of God. I want my sin washed away. I, I, want, I want to be forgiven. I want that grace, that amazing grace that you're talking about. I need it. And I need an advocate because this shame is destroying me. This shame is weighty. This shame is heavy. Come on, if you're a Christian in here this morning, just be praying. Maybe God's working on people. Maybe their heart's beating real fast right now and the Holy Spirit's trying to get somebody's attention. If that's you, I wanna pray with you. All I'm gonna ask is that you would just be bold enough to just put your hand in the air on the count of three just so I can see who I'm praying for this morning. And then after service, at the white tent, we have some, some team there. A gentleman named Mark Zoon is gonna be out there who would love to put some information in your hand, pray with you again, and we can help you on this new journey in relationship with Jesus. But if that's you, come on, on the count of three. One, two, three. Just put your hand up. Who am I praying for this morning? Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Just a couple more seconds. Come on, today's your day. Don't miss it, don't miss it, don't miss it. Awesome, thank you. Come on, I need an advocate, I need an advocate, I need Jesus, I need Jesus, I wanna be found in Christ. Awesome, you can put your hands down, thank you. Church, let's just repeat this prayer after me. Matter of fact, why don't we just go ahead and stand up right now, just let's just stand together as we get ready to pray. I'm gonna lead us, why don't you just pray it? Come on, some of us might be praying it for the very first time, but let's just pray it like a church family. Let's all say, Lord Jesus, this morning, I recognize my need for you, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. You're the helper, you're the advocate, you're the Lord of all lords, the savior of the world. I repent before you, wash my sin white as snow. I receive your grace, I receive your forgiveness into my life. Defend me before the accuser. From this day on, I am yours and you are mine. I turn from living life my own way. I submit to you. I walk in your ways. I desire to be obedient. I desire to pursue you and run after you with everything that I have. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for this amazing grace. I am saved. I am a child of God. I am redeemed and I am moving forward into all that you have called me to do. In Jesus' name, amen.